I know everybody in the Dresden universe is really, really excited about the law coming out this month. But first, we need to talk about a little short story that dropped earlier this year called Little Things. Jim Butcher dropped this new short story, Little Things, in a book called Heroic Hearts, which was an anthology that came out in June. Full disclosure, I did get an arc of this book and I really enjoyed getting to read the Dresden Files short story and the Iron Druid short story. And I got to get introduced to a lot of universes that I had never heard of before or just hadn't gotten around to. And let's just say anthologies have a special place in my heart because they show me what I'm missing in the world. Anyways, we all know that you're on my channel for Dresden Files theories, so let's get back on topic. Spoiler alert, Little Things does take place right after Battleground. So if you haven't gone through Battleground, this is a great opportunity to go get yourself through that part of the series because we're going to be talking a lot of spoilers and I don't want to ruin anything for you. Here are the very important things that Little Things tells us about the series going into the next couple books. First of all, Harry decided that he was going to call himself the Wizard of Chicago and apparently that's important. It's like an actual position with actual work that he has to do instead of, you know, just hiding in his basement and waiting for stuff to happen to him. He's meditating to try to cope with everything that's going on. Toot tells us that he has really messed up hair and bags under his eyes, even though he's sleeping a lot. So something is really, really wrecking him right now. And his arm and his ankle are still wrapped up. So he is still recovering from those injuries. Harry isn't just fighting the outsiders at this point. He has taken Chicago under his protection and is sort of building himself a seat of power there. Harry has to do very mundane stuff, like keep everybody fed. And this includes Toot Toot and all the fairies that make up his personal guard. I thought it was adorable that he was concerned about the economy because apparently the economy being down means that pizza delivery is harder to get. And you know, if I had like a five-year-old or something that I needed to explain things to, I think that that would be a great way to do it. We also have a shift in the story where a lot more people have been exposed to magic. And Harry has always been very open about practicing magic. He's literally listed in the phone book as a wizard, but people have sort of been in denial up until this point. But after the events of Battleground in Chicago basically being torn apart, it's really hard to hide that now or to just stand in denial. And I know that there are some people who will continue to be in denial because apparently that's how this stuff works. But for everybody else, Harry is going to have fans and he is going to have enemies and he is going to have a lot more eyes keeping track of him right now, which could be good because it helps boost his power. It helps people know who he is and know that he is willing to help them. But it also means that anytime he does something even remotely questionable or something where if you just take a little sound bite, it sounds like he's the worst person ever, he's going to run into bad situations that really aren't worth his time. It also kind of feels like Mab and Molly are trying to make the Wizard of Chicago into a mantle, kind of like how Kringle is Kringle and he's also Odin and gets power from those two different identities. In the Christmas Eve short story, link in the description because I talked about that one already, Molly delivers gifts to all the children who were affected by the events in Battleground. It sort of becomes a rivalry or a race with Kringle and it's a super adorable story, but getting back to the point, all the gifts have little tags on them that say that the gift comes from the Wizard of Chicago which means that Harry is going to have a lot more people believing in him, as if he's Santa Claus. Isn't that cool? This exposes Harry to a bunch of new believers, and it also buys him a little bit of goodwill, because who doesn't like presents? We know that magical beings gain power and, you know, stay existing from people believing in them and having that belief basically power them up. The Fae actually were at risk of being wiped out at one point, except for that little thing called the Grimm's Fairy Tales. That brought fairies into the mainstream and kept them at the front of pretty much everybody's mind for a really, really long time. We also know that the Archive can erase beings from existence if they've been forgotten for a thousand years. So if being forgotten is enough to destroy someone, hyping them up gives them power. It feels like social media, the magic version. We also have that one time in Skin Game where Harry says something about being mortal and Mab is like, huh, for now. This makes it really blatantly obvious that Harry is going to become something immortal or at least super powerful and pretty darn close to it. Maybe the Dresden Files as we're reading them right now are Harry's story, his Grimm's fairy tales, if you will. Yes, we have the whole wizard tradition of keeping diaries, but if you make them super public, like Harry's been about his being a wizard from basically the beginning, then he can also use that to fuel his seat of power and to never be forgotten. After all, the first book ends with a quote, My name is Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden. Conjure by it at your own risk. Given that knowing somebody's full name spoken from their lips gives you a lot of power over them, that was a really gutsy move. Harry at this point, or at least at the point in the story where he's writing his story, must know that it would hurt whoever summoned him a heck of a lot more than it would hurt him in order to have that interaction. It's like trying to put Mab in a summoning circle or something. That's a really, really bad idea. Like I wouldn't try it at home, y'all. 
We even have word of Jim that says that summoning Harry is a lot more dangerous to other people than it is to him. So, mini theory confirmed. And hey, his full name being written down is probably much less effective for this whole point, but I'm not going to risk it. It also becomes blatantly clear in the story that the castle is not immune to attack. Harry has some pretty good security on this place in addition to the security that sort of brought over with the wards and stuff that's literally in the stone of this castle. Bob is some sort of upgraded version of Jarvis from Iron Man or maybe even the magical equivalent of an Alexa or a Google Home. Now he does have blue eyes in the story and that's concerning. The last time he had blue eyes, he was evil Bob. And even though earlier in the series, Harry basically made him delete that part of himself, I wonder if him having blue eyes now sort of like reconnects him to something deep down that he had hidden that might not have gotten deleted. Because, you know, Bob's really old, he's connected to this castle that's really old, and we haven't really had the magic that goes with this castle explained to us because, you know, Harry just moved in. So I think that there's a lot more to like go down that rabbit hole, but we just don't have the full picture yet. For some reason, the technology in the castle plays nice with Dresden, and I know that he had the radio in there that was like from the 40s, so it's pretty much in a safe zone as far as technology goes. But Harry was able to use a microwave, and he was able to be in a kitchen that probably has a lot of modern conveniences. Now, he does have the winter mantle, and he's shown that he's weak to iron, and stainless steel has iron in it, so there might be some sort of magic negate thing going on with that. But instead of making technology's allergy to Harry Dresden lessen, I would expect there to be more hijinks. So maybe that'll get explained later. We're also seeing that Toot Toot, just as a character and as part of Harry's personal guard, has gotten a lot bigger physically and more powerful as Harry gets more powerful. This probably deserves a video on its own, but since this book really revolves around Toot Toot and Toot Toot's point of view, we're going to talk about it a little bit here. Back in Stormfront, when Harry summoned Toot Toot for us the first time, he drank some blood of Harry's that was mixed in with the milk and stuff that he had been offered, and that might bind him to Harry and have him sort of grow as Harry grows. Tutu has gone on so many adventures with Harry and has gotten a lot of big wins. And I know that Jim Butcher really, really likes Dungeons and Dragons, so if Tutu was part of Harry's party on all these adventures, he's probably leveled up a bit. And we gotta give Toot Toot some credit here because he's gone from being an informant who just trades information for pizza to someone who is Harry's very, very dear and strong ally, which is why I think it's really, really cool that we got a short story from Toot Toot's perspective because he's a character that's forgotten about a lot, but he's actually really important. But jumping back to the castle, we gotta talk about the castle as an entity on its own. Marcon is said to have brought this castle back brick by brick from Scotland. If Chicago's bureaucracy is nearly as bad as Atlanta's, then he got it built a heck of a lot faster than he really should have. Six months is a really, really short time to transport a castle brick by brick to a new place and then get all your permits pulled and everything taken care of. And I know Marcone has connections. He has that whole like underworld crime lord thing going for him. But still, I'm impressed at how long it took for him to get everything done. We also know of another castle in Scotland, which is basically the White Council's headquarters. And there's a lot of magic stuff going on there. So it really tells me that that's probably not the only castle in Scotland that had a lot of magical mojo going on. Harry's castle probably had a lot of wizards working on it back in the day to get all the wards and all the magical protection stuff put on it. And it might also be something that gives us a hint to how Demon Reach was constructed. And I'm really, really excited to learn if there's any sort of connections. Right now, that's sort of like my personal tinfoil hat theory is that that castle is going to teach us stuff about Demon Reach. But I haven't been able to find as much stuff as I would really want to in order to make a video on it just yet. One thing that I'm a little bit confused on as far as the castle goes is how thresholds are going to be important going forward. We know that the castle is built on land that used to be where the boarding house was, where Harry lived. And we also know that thresholds are strongest when it's like a family house, someplace that's had a lot of love and support and been a real home for a very long time. You know, like Murphy's house or the carpenter's house. And we also know that apartments don't really have that sort of threshold protection because they're more temporary housing. Even though in the year 2022, that seems to be changing. The castle might have some threshold powers left over from back in the day when it was a castle in Scotland, but it also might have some, you know, growing up to do. And this might be something that makes the castle more strong and powerful as people live in it and work in it 
and as it becomes more of a fixture or a long-standing fixture, at least in Chicago. So remember back a couple books ago where Harry had to hide the swords in the Never Never and he made a portal to a garden over there from his basement? I'm concerned about if that portal still exists or if something changed because the castle is now in that location instead of the boarding house being at that location. Moving through the ways is kind of a weird thing in the Dresden Files and I think it's going to become more important later on. But for right now, we have to keep what we know in our back pocket in case it becomes important later. Like what happens if the castle is under siege and the defenses get broken and everybody needs to escape. Going through the ways in the Never Never is going to become extremely important at that point. And last but certainly not least, probably the biggest thing that this book tells us is that Harry is still not over Murphy. He does seem to be handling it better than he handled the aftermath of Great Peril and the beginning of Summer Night when Susan left him, but this is still a very, very, very fresh blow. In both cases, we have Will the Werewolf trying to help him get through this, which is really important because we know that when Harry's alone, he sort of collapses in on himself, he becomes very introverted, and that can be a very bad thing. Harry's support system is really, really important to him, and we keep going back to something that Michael said in the beginning of Great Peril. Michael basically told Harry that it was dangerous for Harry to neglect the personal relationships he had and when he tries to cut everybody off, things could get really, really bad. And I'm pretty sure that Michael wasn't just talking about Harry's mental health. But the fact that Harry is trying to handle things in a healthy way and to fall back on his community for help and guidance shows that he's grown and he's learned a better way to handle things than he had when he was younger. And all of this love and support is going to be very, very important for Harry to not go warlock. He got really, really close to going warlock back when Rudolph had just done the deed and he was just barely able to get pulled back into the good side from Butters, who is a literal Jedi. So, you know, not going to the dark side. It's kind of funny in that way, but it was also a really, really powerful and sad scene. So I didn't notice that the first time. One of the things that probably made this a little bit easier is Harry's idea that duty is very, very important. Harry's always had the sense of duty that compels him to put himself in danger and to finish what he starts, even when he technically could say that it wasn't his problem and just go home. This attitude has saved him in the past, like remember in Summer Night when the gatekeeper said that if Harry had failed his test and just gone home and said that he was done with everything, that he would have voted to oust him from the White Council. Harry also didn't take McCoy's offer to go hide out on his farm when Duke Ortega came to town, and I don't think that Harry is going to leave everybody in Chicago hanging now that we have the endgame stuff going on. It's really nice to see Harry's community sort of rally around him and help him and return the favor for everything that Harry's doing. And finally, something that also deserves its own video is Harry and Laura might have some complications with him still being, you know, in love with Murphy. After all, white court vampires can't touch anybody who's in love or been in love. And we know that there are ways around this, like with Justine and Thomas and their uh, love partner. <laughs> but we also have the wedding coming up between him and Laura. And we know from the story about Billy and George's wedding that if Billy had married Jenny Greenteeth, then that would have messed up the whole love connection he had with Georgia. And it would have made him vulnerable to white court shenanigans. So maybe marrying Laura is what's going to break the whole Murphy love thing with Dresden and make him become available to give her an heir. And then we have to see if Harry survives her white court mojo. And I think that this is going to be a very important topic for later that has a lot more nuance than I've found just yet. But hey, you know what happens when I go down a rabbit hole. If you like what I do, please hit the subscribe button and join the caffeination. We'd love to have you. I post bookish videos pretty much whenever I can get around to it because I'm a busy adult with many important things to do. Like, share, subscribe on all your social media, and if you think I suck at this, leave me a comment down below and I'll try to suck better next time. Bye!